A few weeks ago, Joseph Stromberg asked me why I thought uh, so many neoconservatives had an interest in the classics, in either Greek history or Roman history. Um, well, as it happens, a lot of these uh, neoconservatives are Hellenists. They're people who specifically study Greek history. Um, Leo Strauss, for example, who, quite infamous uh, founder of Straussianism and very influential uh, thinker whose thought the neoconservatives have adopted, uh, was himself a Hellenist. He didn't do a lot of work on Rome. Uh, be this as it may, though, um, nonetheless, we do see a certain uh, fascination that Rome exercises upon the imaginations of neoconservatives and, uh, for that matter, uh, students of real politique. Uh, why should this be the case? Uh, well, well, where uh, real politique is concerned, uh, some of this is just pure power worship, I think. Um, and this was true uh, in the ancient world as well as in the modern world. We see a number of ancient uh, sources who are very much interested in the uh, development of the Roman Empire simply because it was the biggest, most powerful thing that existed at the time. It even eclipsed uh, the accomplishments of Alexander the Great, which themselves had been tremendously influential. Um, in the ancient world, you always found people trying to emulate, trying to surpass uh, Alexander. When the Romans came onto the scene, uh, that impressed people even more. So if you wanted to be something, if you wanted to be world famous as a conqueror, uh, you had to understand what made Rome successful and emulate that. And I think this um, exercises a certain attraction upon uh, people who like to, well, who like global power uh, even today. Um, but I mean, you, you can kind of understand uh, the realpolitik aspect of it. You can see um, that, you know, power even if you're not necessarily uh, desiring to acquire it yourself, is nonetheless something that is of interest to study. It is something that uh, is likely to affect your life. And so, you know, that's where the uh, realpolitik angle might come in, even for people who are not uh, sort of megalomaniacs, as, uh, as some of these guys may be. Uh, but I think that there happens to be actually quite a bit more to the uh, fascination that Rome exercises over, well, neoconservatives, but also people all over the political spectrum. And that is... Um, that Rome stands as an example of what I would call military virtue, um, which is something that I think we see um, just very highly valued uh, in our society today. Uh, there's this idea that uh, military, the, the military, in one form or another, instills not only martial virtues like courage and uh, discipline, but also certain higher virtues as well, perhaps loyalty to a cause greater than oneself, um, and, uh, and also things like uh, the ability to lead men and the ability to uh, perhaps uh, excel in competition, things like that. Uh, there's also an aspect of uh, the fact that militaries make very firm uh, sex distinctions. So uh, oftentimes you'll hear conservatives these days complaining about uh, sort of the effeminization of America. Um, well, the military is one institution you can point to and say, okay, that is quite masculine. Uh, one of the things you see here, and this is all by way of preamble, and you'll see where this is going in just a second here, but um, in the, in the 1990s, you saw a lot of these you know, very popular talk shows, uh, Oprah Winfrey or Ricky Lake or Jerry Springer, whoever happens to be uh, your personal favorite. They would have um, segments uh, along the theme of my teenager is out of control. And uh, the solution to this was usually boot camp. Uh, <laughs> we're going to send the kid to something that you know, emulates basic training for a Marine or for the, uh, the uh, Green Berets or something, and somehow this is going to make the kid behave uh, much better. Um, so you can see, I, I think that is, is an instantiation, that's an example of this belief in military virtue. Yeah, I think you can see it as well in, for example, Bill Buckley's enthusiasm for compuls compulsory uh, national service. This idea that, you know, you take people who are just civilians, who are just self-interested, and you put them through either military or quasi-militaristic training, and somehow they become better people for it. Um, there, uh, there's also an idea that's kind of even broader than that, which is that the military is a socially integrative force that the military helps construct a national identity, and that the military, well, for example, uh, can erode uh, racial uh, barriers between peoples. They can help integrate society in that sense, but it can also help integrate society uh, ideologically. It helps create you know, a sense of Americanism, that the military not only uh, enacts patriotism by going out and, and uh, you know, creating an uh, opportunity for people to exercise their love of country, but that it also uh, creates a kind of patriotism by uh, creating this sense of an institution which all Americans, regardless of you know, background can support. They can say, oh, those are our boys, those are our troops. Well, what does any of this have to do with Rome? Well, Rome is the military society par excellence. There really hasn't been, uh, I don't think, any other civilization that has been quite so uh, thoroughgoingly militaristic as Rome, uh, from its very earliest founding in 753 BC uh, down to the period I'm going to be covering, which is that of the 
Julio-Claudian uh, emperors, who are the, the first emperors of the Roman Empire, or we might say the Roman Principate. Um, Rome, of course, had been a republic before it became an empire, but even as a republic, it still had an empire in the sense of having territories uh, beyond its own borders. So that's an important uh, point to make there. Uh, so for the most part, I'm going to refer to the Roman Empire, as you guys probably know it, as the Roman Principate, because it's, it's much clearer. Uh, we're not just talking about... Well, the distinction between the Republic and the so-called Empire is that uh, you had this, the rise of uh, sort of autocratic rule. Uh, it's not that the, uh, the one hadn't had these foreign possessions and that the other did. So anyway, Rome is a uh, military society par excellence, as I say. And so I think we can, uh, by looking at Rome, uh, gain some insight into the notion of whether or not there is such a thing as martial virtue, military virtue. Whether, in fact, uh, the Roman military helped to stabilize Roman society, or whether it seems to us to have destabilized it. And uh, if, if it did, in fact, destabilize it, then uh, certainly that is a cautionary tale for us, and perhaps there are lessons that we could learn from that. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons why Rome is particularly interesting as an example is because uh, you certainly do have, uh, as I said, uh, this great power that you know, encompasses most of the known world at the time, and you also have um, you know, a, gr a great deal of courage, a great deal of um, manliness in the Roman legions, but at the same time, you also have uh, these phenomena that are associated with what we would call decadence. Uh, I think you know, plenty of people here probably know about the kinds of crimes and uh, unnatural acts committed by Caligula, Nero, and emperors like that, uh, you know, ranging from uh, incest with their own sisters to uh, cruel and unusual punishments of totally innocent people, all kinds of things like that. I mean, so there is that, that kind of personal decadence, but I think decadence can be expanded into a much larger concept. Uh, we can also ask about uh, the sort of political and civil instability that existed at Rome in, you know, around the time of the birth of Christ. We can also talk about uh, you know, the demographic status of a certain country, uh, in this case Rome. If, a, uh, if, if your population is increasing, we can probably say that that's, you know, if not a good thing, then that's at least a sign of, of growth. It certainly is that. Uh, and decadence would be the opposite. Decadence would be demographic decline. Um, we can also look at economic freedom. We can say that, okay, well, if you have flourishing economic freedom, that's probably a good thing. Uh, and certainly, ethically, we would say that is a good thing. Uh, and you can look at the opposite. You can say that, well, if you have uh, economic freedom being abrogated, that that's probably a sign of decadence. That's a sign of something going wrong. Um, and finally, we might look at the uh, military itself in our investigation into Rome and ask ourselves, in one, well, in one sense, it wouldn't seem to be decadent because it would seem to be flourishing. It would seem to be going out and becoming more powerful than it had ever been before in the period that we're about to examine. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the actual conditions of individual soldiers and commanders, uh, they were often quite pitiable indeed. So in one sense, the Roman military in this period you know, couldn't fairly be described as decadent, but in another, I think it could, especially where the individual is concerned. Um, so in Rome, you have this combination of things. You have both... Uh, extreme militarism and also decadence, both on the individual level and in all of these you know, broader political, demographic, or economic levels. Uh, and so that's why Rome presents uh, quite a, a question to us. Uh, is it the case, in fact, that these are simply things that happened uh, accidentally at the same time? Or is it the case, in fact, that there's some sort of relationship here? Perhaps the military uh, lessened the degree of decadence in Rome at this time, or perhaps the military actually contributed to, maybe even caused, uh, the sorts of decadence that we'll be looking at. I should perhaps uh, give you some background on um, the Roman army and uh, its place in the Roman Republic prior to this period. So we're looking at basically the time from 509 BC when Rome becomes a republic down to about the time when Julius Caesar is assassinated. And actually, well, a little bit before that, because um, by, by the time Caesar is assassinated, the republic has already fallen into civil war and, uh, and decay. Um, well, actually, even, even before Rome had become a republic, uh, back between 753 BC and 509 BC, uh, Rome was still a very militaristic society. Um, and in fact, this is quite true of many early Indo-European societies. Uh, some of you may know that the, uh, even to this day, the motto of Rome is SPQR, Senatus Populus Quae Romanus, um, the Senate and People of Rome. And that may sound unobjectionable to you. Uh, you know, okay, you have a Senate and then you have the people. Uh, but actually, this phrase uh, conceals something that uh, might have been known to the early Romans, but that is unknown to most of us. And that is that the word populus doesn't originally mean people as we use it today, in just general sense of individuals or persons. Uh, it originally meant an army. 
And this is actually true of, of other Indo-European cultures as well. I, I believe the German folk originally meant army as well. So uh, there was always, you know, uh, in this sort of Indo-European background, a certain militaristic element. Uh, and in city-states like Rome, uh, the army was from the very beginning a very important constitutive element. Uh, now, in, in its very earliest period, uh, between 753 BC and 509 BC, uh, you know, Rome was certainly uh, trying to expand, but it wasn't necessarily for malevolent reasons. Uh, Rome was in Italy. It had uh, various belligerent neighbors who were interested in conquering Rome's territory or conquering one another's territory, for that matter. So you would have, for example, the Etruscans or uh, you know, other uh, city-states within Italy uh, impinging upon Roman uh, independence. And there's actually some reason to think that uh, during the, uh, the period of kings before the Republic, so the period between 753 and 509, that Rome may in fact have been subjugated by the Etruscans. Uh, we can suspect that because several of the names of the Roman kings are in fact Etruscan names, not Latin names. Rome had become a, uh, a superpower, however, um, towards the end of the third century and the beginning of the, uh, the second century BC, when Rome had come into contact with uh, another superpower, a North African city-state called Carthage. Rome had um, encountered Carthaginian forces in Sicily and in Spain, and uh, both uh, Rome and, both Carth and Carthage had wanted to gain control of Sicily and Spain because these were quite rich areas, especially Sicily. Um, so this uh, meeting of two growing regional powers led to warfare, and it was warfare that Rome ultimately won. And uh, this, would ultimately, this would have some quite severe consequences that I'll discuss in, in just a moment here. But basically, uh, the outline I'm providing is that Rome grew from a, a small city which perhaps was conquered by other peoples uh, to one that was able to stand on its own in Italy, to one that was ultimately um, expanding enough and successful enough in its contact with other peoples. Well, it's successful in the military sense that uh, if a city attacked Rome, Rome would not only uh, defeat it, but then would also pull it into its own political orbit. But Rome was uh, sufficiently successful and powerful in that regard that uh, it was emerging as a world power by about the third century BC. Um, and in fact, um, in the course of the, the wars with Carthage, uh, Rome, you know, uh, Car Carthage in fact allied itself with uh, certain Macedonian and Greek warlords, and this brought Rome into contact with them as well, and uh, Rome was able to subjugate Greece. Um, so, for example, a Greek um, historian by the name of Polybius, who lived from uh, about 200 BC to 118 BC, um, became very interested in Roman power and its... Uh, its forms and its, its, its ways of operating. And to that effect, he wrote, uh, well, he wrote a history, and, um, which I have here, in fact, and discussed uh, some of the reasons for Rome's military success. He attributed a great deal of it, in fact, to uh, the citizen soldier, the fact that the Romans, uh, unlike the Carthaginians, were not reliant upon mercenaries and foreign troops, that the Romans, in fact, did their own fighting. What they did was, uh, you know, they had Every male citizen of Rome was liable for military service. And, uh, you know, military service uh, was for a certain period of time because the Romans were fighting, you know, as a cohesive unit. Uh, they were all sort of uh, knew one another. They, they would feel shame if one of them failed to perform well on the battlefield. A uh, mercenary was sort of less uh, motivated by that factor because a mercenary, of course, wanted his pay. He wasn't necessarily concerned with glory. But the Romans, they would go above and beyond the call of duty, or so Polybius argues, because uh, they wanted to, uh, you know, perform well in front of their countrymen, the people they would see every day. Um, there followed uh, from the, uh, the uh, Punic Wars, the wars with Carthage, basically a continual series of wars, um, social wars, for example, in which the various city-states that Rome had conquered in Italy decided that, well, um, I, I should mention these city-states, once they were conquered by Rome, were themselves liable for providing auxiliaries to the Roman uh, military. They had to provide uh, certain legions of their own that the Romans would then command and, and use to expand their own, their own power. Um, basically, these Italian city-states said, look, uh, we speak a very similar language to you Romans. Uh, you've, you're conscripting us for your warfare. You should extend citizenship to us. We should have the same rights and privileges as Romans themselves. Uh, the Roman Senate didn't like the idea of this very much, and so it led to a war between Rome and its allies. It's Socii, and that's why it's called a, a social war. Uh, and there were various other wars as well. Uh, in the east, for example, 
uh, against uh, a fellow by the name of Mithridates, who was, kingdom, who was the king, rather, of uh, what is you know, an area that is now part of Turkey, Pontus. Uh, and then you had just the increasing power of, uh, of generals and their armies at Rome itself. Um, I, can, I can illustrate this, actually, by reference to a, a notion that we might borrow from Robert Higgs, uh, who in Crisis in Leviathan describes how uh, in the opportunity provided by a crisis, a war, for example, uh, government can grow in ways that it can't during peacetime. And that afterwards, uh, there's often a tendency, especially if there have been certain ideological preconditions met, um, for the, um, the state to, to remain at a slightly inflated level. Even as it decreases from its, its crisis level, it nonetheless uh, remains larger than it had been before the whole cycle started. Uh, we see this, for example, in Rome. Uh, in Rome, during the earliest period of the Republic, there were about four legions. That was the Roman army. And the legions were about 6,000 men apiece. Uh, during the Punic Wars, though, around you know the uh, late third uh, century, early second century BC, um, well, this ballooned because they were fighting a war against a world superpower, against Carthage, and so they went from four legions to about eleven legions, and then afterwards, uh, these a lot of these legions stayed around, and as Rome continued to be sucked into more and more wars, I, I shouldn't say sucked into them because in fact the Romans were quite uh, happy to engage in them, but as Rome. Uh, out of the aftermath of its Carth wars with Carthage, uh, came into wars with Greece and with uh, Mithridates. Um, the need for an increased number of legions continued to exist. So we went from four legions to about 11, uh, and then it went down a little bit, and then it ballooned again to about 12 or 14 with the wars with Greece and by the time of the social wars. And then uh, ultimately, uh, it, would go it was going to reach about 28 or 30 legions by the time of the, uh, the civil wars, by the time of well, shortly before Caesar's assassination in, in 44 BC. Um, and then afterwards, Augustus, the, uh, the first uh, emperor of Rome, the first uh, princeps, uh, he would stabilize the uh, number of legions to 28. So you can see that's quite a, uh, quite a growth of, the, of state power right there, from four legions to 12 to 28. Um, I should <clears throat> very briefly describe for you uh, what, what these legions were like, how they were composed. Um, originally, as, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, the, uh, the legion required, you had to be a Roman citizen to be in a legion originally, and you also had to have enough property, uh, you had to be both a landowner and you had to have enough money to uh, equip yourself to buy whatever weapons and armor you would need for the fight. Um, gradually this changed though, because there were only a limited number of large enough landowners or people with enough wealth to equip themselves, and as a result, um, they had to sort of lower the threshold for letting people come into the military because they needed these much larger armies to fight these world wars. Uh, so you had a, a diminution over time of the uh, property qualifications for service. Uh, and there's also the factor involved there that if you are a, a landowner, you actually need to come back to your land to supervise, at the very least, uh, its, its maintenance. And for a lot of these guys, they were kind of yeoman farmers. They were actually just small individual landowners who would actually be involved in tilling their own land. If you're going to have these very large armies, um, they still disbanded these armies from time to time, but they were, they, were, they were in service for much longer periods of time than they had been before. If you're going to have these kinds of armies, you need people who are not uh, required to go back to their farms and uh, attend to their, their land and their own personal affairs uh, for however many months out of a year, six months or whatever. Uh, and so uh, there was a certain uh, appeal to having um, people with less property in the military to going towards the uh, uh, you know, people who just didn't have anything to lose. They didn't have to come back and attend to their own business for uh, a couple of months a year. Uh, even, even well before we get to the point of the, uh, the Julio-Claudian emperors, um, in extraordinary circumstances, propertyless persons could be enlisted in the Roman army anyway, if it was a sufficient emergency. So again, what we have here is a sort of Higgsian effect, where at first you have something that's just kind of exceptional circumstance, over time, it becomes less and less exceptional as the threshold of what constitutes a crisis either decreases or else the, uh, the simple growth of the state gets them involved in more and more wars. And as a result, there's a continual crisis. And so there's always a, a uh, exception which allows for the enlistment of people who normally would not be able to be enlisted. Um, it did, of course, change the nature of the Roman army uh, that you should have this kind of, um, well, proletarianization is exactly what it is. Uh, the entry into the military forces of people who didn't have a lot of money. Uh, for one thing, it, it actually contributed to professionalization. 
because people who didn't have a lot of property, who entered the Roman military, um, they wanted to get something out of it. They wanted to get some pay out of it. Whereas uh, you'd had, you know, um, a degree of that uh, in the earlier army that had been a slightly, uh, composed of slightly wealthier citizens. But of course, these wealthier citizens didn't need the army in order to make a livelihood. Whereas the, uh, a lot of the uh, property list persons, the, the proles, uh, they did. And also because uh, a lot of these proletarians needed their uh, positions in the military to make a living, and it was a much better living than they could make on their own because they owned no land, uh, they became quite loyal to their commanders because the commanders were the ones who were dispersing uh, the spoils of war. As a result, what you see happening over time is that the Roman military, because of proletarianization, actually becomes more loyal to its commanders than to the city of Rome itself. Uh, and honor becomes much less of a consideration for the military than getting paid by the commander. Um, in fact, as time went on, um, the Romans became uh, so needful of having uh, yet more people enlist in their, their legions, and these continual wars had so damaged the population of Italy and of Rome itself that the Romans had to resort to enlisting within their own legions, as Roman legionaries, uh, people who were not Romans at all. Uh, so, for example, in the civil wars, you know, in the, uh, the first century BC, um, you actually see Pompey, uh, the major rival of Julius Caesar, uh, enlisting um, what he called a legio vernacula. A, uh, he just got some Spanish citizens from his Spanish uh, territories and said, okay, you guys are now a Roman legion and you're going to fight alongside my Roman legions. We're not going to you know, pretend that there's a distinction or anything. You guys are, are the real thing. Um, and this was different from how it had been before where you would sometimes have foreign forces fighting alongside Roman forces, but they were not considered to be actually Roman themselves. Uh, Pompey changed that. He said, okay, uh, you guys are now going to be constituted as part of our own military and uh, as a reward, we're probably going to give you citizenship at the end of, uh, at the end of your time. Um, you may want to know uh, what it was like to serve in the Roman military. Uh, during, the, the, uh, during most of the Republican period, um, as we said, uh, every Roman citizen was liable for military service, every male Roman citizen. Uh, on average, this tended to be about six years of service. Uh, at a maximum, it could go up to about 16 years. Um, and in fact, as you might imagine, as these wars continue, as Rome's power is expanding, uh, there is a, the state sees a more and more of a need to uh, keep people in the allegiance for much longer periods. So in fact, uh, while six years of service had originally been the average and the legal maximum had originally been 16, uh, by the time of the civil wars you have people who've spent you know, 20 or even 30 years uh, in the legions. Um, under Augustus, after the civil wars, um, Augustus the first emperor, he uh, legally increased the amount uh, of service that a, a Roman citizen uh, could be called upon to provide in the military to 20 years. And in addition to that, a further five years of um, reserve duty, which meant that, okay, after 20 years, you'd be decommissioned from your legion, but you still had to tag along with your legion in its uh, sort of baggage train. And uh, in an emergency, you might be called upon to fight. But you weren't supposed to be um, doing the regular duties that the legion would have to do. For example, uh, once you were uh, a reservist, you didn't have to clean latrines or whatever uh, might be required. You were just there to be uh, a sort of auxiliary, to be a help in the case of a dire emergency uh, if you were needed. Um, we say that Augustus increased the, the, uh, the maximum service period from 16 years to 20 years. Um, that's true legally. Uh, in terms of actual practice, um, you, like I said, you already had people serving 20 years and more within the Roman legions. And in fact, even after uh, Augustus increased the legal limit, uh, you still had people serving much longer than they were uh, supposed to. Um, now, naturally, if you have uh, this enormous world-conquering military, uh, you have to pay for it. And uh, not only that, but also, what do you do with these guys who um, you know, are decommissioned, these guys who, are, uh, who do retire from the military? Now think about it, uh, if you have a sort of seasonal army of citizen soldiers, um, you know, they go to war, then they go back to their farms at the end of that, and they take care of their farms, they have their own uh, way of making a living, they're fine. If on the other hand, you're taking men, even assuming that they do have a farm, even assuming that they do uh, have you know, some means of sustaining themselves, but if you take them and then keep them for 20 years in the military, what can they do after that? Um, even assuming that they had had property, by this point, their property is either worthless or has been taken over by somebody else uh, because, in fact, uh, things like that did happen. If you were away from your property for long enough, the Romans could be quite uh, glib about uh, what might happen to it. Um, but, you know, 
after after twenty years of just being a soldier, you're not very well um, you're not very well positioned to do anything else. So this was a very serious problem. Uh, you had all these veterans, and uh, you know they needed some sort of pension plan. Well, uh, Augustus for a while, and before Augustus, uh, Pompey and Caesar during the civil wars, uh, had simply um, given land to the veterans. They'd said, okay, well, uh, we'll give you a land grant in Italy or something, and you know, you can learn to farm again, uh, maybe, you can ha maybe you still have some slaves or something, and you can, you can make a living that way, even if your old property has been lost. Um, this didn't work so well, though. There's only so much land to go around in Italy, and what Caesar and Pompey and later Augustus had to do, in fact, was to confiscate the land from other landowners. So, for example, the, uh, the Roman poet Virgil, who is uh, sort of the greatest poet of all uh, of the Latin language, uh, even he, uh, in his youth, had been expropriated by Augustus. His family estate had been confiscated and given over to veterans. Um, you might think of some of the situations that pertain right now in Africa. Uh, I think in, perhaps in Zimbabwe, um, for example, there is this... Uh, you have these people who claim to be military veterans in Africa, oftentimes they aren't, who um, say that, well, you have to give us you know, um, land. You have to take land from the white settlers and give it to us because we need to make a living. Something like that was happening at Rome. You had, uh, in order to keep the military happy, in order to give the, uh, the veterans a pension, you had to give them land. Well, I mean, this was just causing so many problems that Augustus eventually abandoned it. And what he decided was, well, instead of uh, doing this, instead of confiscating people's land, giving it to veterans, what I'm going to do is just give the veterans a pension, give them a, a one-time cash payout when they are decommissioned, when they're demobilized, and uh, it'll be large enough that they'll be able to survive for the rest of their lives off of this, uh, this cash gratuity. Well, as you might imagine, um, this cash gratuity doesn't just you know, grow on trees either. It has to come from someplace. And uh, just as the state had resorted to expropriating landowners earlier, in order to give veterans uh, land, uh, the state now resorted to taxation in order to give um, veterans a, a pension or a cash gratuity. Uh, so now I go into um, Julio-Claudian taxation uh, because you know Augustus was the one who set this up. So we're now you know, firmly in this period between 31 BC and 68 AD, uh, during which you have these first five emperors: Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius. Oh, sorry, Caligula, Claudius, and then Nero. Um, in order to provide for these pensions, uh, Augustus decided he would uh, form a new sort of treasury uh, because his own, his own finances were already stretched pretty thin. Uh, Augustus you know, was having to maintain this enormous army, uh, this enormous Roman army of 28 legions of 6,000 men each. Uh, just paying their salaries was an enormous drain on the state revenues and it was in fact taking up about 50% of state revenue, maybe a little bit less than that, but it was, it was quite high. And then beyond uh, what went to the military for pay, you also had uh, at the time um, you know, things like the, uh, the corn dole. You had to give bread to the, uh, the propertyless persons in Rome in order to keep them happy and keep them from starving or whatever. Um, so Augustus couldn't just rely on the funds he already had in order to pay these, uh, these pensions, these cash gratuities to the veterans. Uh, what he did then was institute new taxes. Um, tax, Romans had been very tax averse through their own, their own their whole history. They had had a few indirect taxes. Um, there was a tax on the manumission of uh, slaves. There was a tax on auctions. Uh, but for the most part, the Romans didn't like to be taxed themselves. This was why you had provinces. Uh, the whole point of uh, the Romans going out and conquering other peoples was that you could make conquered peoples pay their taxes to you um, rather than having to pay taxes yourself uh, as long as you wanted um, you know, uh, this sort of public fund. Uh, so what Augustus did is he, he said, well, you know, we, we can only get so much revenue out of the provinces. We're going to have to institute some new taxes here in Rome itself. And in fact, he did. He instituted a sales tax of about 1% and an inheritance tax of 5%. Uh, and this went towards the new military treasury, the Irarium Militare. Uh, in the provinces, uh, you, it, it's actually a kind of interesting uh, situation in the provinces the provinces have been in, in terribly bad shape during the, uh, the Republican period because in the Republican period, um, you had sort of temporary uh, rule in these provinces. A proconsul or a proprietor uh, would be assigned to the consul for a year, during which time, as you might imagine, uh, this proconsul would try to take as much money as possible from the, uh, the province and then at the end of his year just take all the money and go back to Rome. Uh, under the empire, because you had a more stable rule, you had a more sort of hoppian situation where um, 
a single man was in charge. He, ga he gave uh, a legate responsibility for raising funds and controlling a, uh, a certain um, a province. And as a result, the provincials were actually quite happy. Um, they were no longer being exploited from year to year. Instead, they were, you know, they were still being exploited, but it wasn't uh, as much of a, uh, a mad grab of all their property as it had been in the past. And also, Augustus's, um, his, his way of looking at the world had changed a bit because he now had to keep not only the masses at Rome satisfied, but he also had to um, sort of prevent rebellions in the provinces. He didn't want a lot of that going on uh, while he was still trying to conquer you know, uh, territories in the east for example, and just maintain this enormous worldwide empire that the Romans had built up. So in fact, uh, Augustus had good reason to liberalize policies towards the provinces, liberalize tax collection there a little bit. Um, but in order to make up the revenue, what he did was to clamp down on Rome itself and to impose uh, the 1% sales tax and the 5% inheritance tax. Um, and of course, two points to be made here is not only was this bad for Romans themselves in Rome, who had previously not had to pay these taxes, but also, this was a very un-Roman thing to do. Romans just, you know, didn't pay taxes, except in very rare uh, cases. Um, what you had here was, was a novelty. Uh, in Rome was a very, very conservative um, uh, city. Uh, they really didn't like the idea of novelties. They didn't like the idea that a government could come and do something that it had never done before. Uh, so, you know, if you had these ancient taxes, like the manumission tax, it was less of a problem. But when you had new taxes instituted, that was a growth in, in government and a change in culture uh, that to the Romans was absolutely revolting. But nonetheless, um, this, uh, these taxes were less of a problem for Augustus than it would have been to try to expropriate landowners and give their land to veterans. So uh, in fact, this irarium militare stayed in existence for a while. You had these sales and inheritance taxes. Uh, interestingly enough, Caligula abolished uh, the sales tax for a while. Uh, it was his way of uh, gaining some popularity with the Roman masses. Um, but it seems like this tax was later reimposed, although the records are not entirely clear on that point. So um, one of the changes you had had in the Julio-Claudian period was that in order to uh, pay for the military, especially to pay for those pensions and the retirement benefits, you had the institution of new taxes. Well, uh, the Julio-Claudian Julio period is also a very interesting time uh, in terms of its demographics. Um, if you're going to have an army that's you know, uh, a, uh, a superpower, you not only need the money to pay for it, but you also need enough men to serve in it. Where do you get these men from? Uh, Rome had, been, uh, had suffered under a civil war for about a century, and that's you know, quite apart from all these wars in the East and uh, in Gaul and so forth. So uh, all this had led to a great deal of attrition of actual Roman citizens. Uh, people had been killed in the wars, and uh, for that matter, um, some of them were just you know, um, you know, maimed uh, in the wars as well and just uh, could no longer be of, of military service. Um, and also, as you might expect, um, well, in some ways it is un un it's actually unexpected. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, demographic studies tend to show that in war, I guess, populations uh, can sometimes increase. You often have uh, a lot of new, uh, a lot more reproduction than you have in, in times of peace. Uh, but that wasn't so much the case uh, in this period. Uh, Rome actually was experiencing a uh, demographic decline. Um, War had, had partially depopulated uh, Rome and Italy, and especially the senatorial class. The senatorial class had suffered not only from uh, being involved in all these wars, but also it was the senators who had the most to fear personally uh, from the, the emperor, because the senators might you know, uh, displace him. So you had had you know, proscription lists, and prominent men were being killed because they posed a threat to the emperor, um, and earlier to the, uh, the triumvirs. Um, and so for that reason, uh, you that contributed to Rome's uh, demographic problems. Uh, Pliny the Elder actually describes this as a uh, penuria juventutis, a shortage of young men. And it was also a shortage of young men because uh, fewer and fewer young men wanted to volunteer for the military. For the most part, Augustus tried to keep uh, enrollment in the, uh, the legions as voluntary as possible. He did not want to conscript Romans and Italians because of the, uh, the uproar that that would cause. Uh, but here you had a shortage. Men didn't want to enlist in the legions for the very simple reason that you, you might be serving in the legion for 15 or 20 years or even more, uh, your whole lifetime would go down the toilet, basically, um, if you enlisted. So they didn't do it. Um, well, so how do you make up for this shortfall? Well, what Augustus and later emperors did was to turn to recruiting foreigners, for example. Uh, the precedent for that had already been established by Pompey when he had created this vernacular uh, legio, this um, you know, sort of Spanish 
uh, legion. Um, so, for example, in the uh, Julio-Claudian period and a bit later on, um, between uh, uh, the rule of Augustus and that of uh, Caligula, the legions were about 65% uh, Roman and, and Italian. Uh, between Claudius and Nero, the, that percentage declined to 48%. And then later on, from uh, 68 until 117 AD, the percentage of Italians in the Roman legion, and Italians includes the Romans, of course, was only 21%. So increasingly, uh, the Romans were having to enlist um, non-Romans in order to fill out the military. As you can imagine, this had some very significant uh, effects. Um, Romans might have um, compunctions about going to war with other Romans. Um, I might not want to kill someone you know, I know who's a countryman, uh, but I might have much less resolve about that, much less uh, of a reservation, if um, you know, this is someone to whom I'm not related, I don't, may, maybe don't even speak the same language. Although for the most part, they tried to make sure that the legions were learning Latin uh, for obvious military reasons, you have to communicate. Uh, nonetheless, the sort of um, sense of, of Romanness uh, declined, and therefore the legions had less uh, reservations about, if necessary, going to war with other Romans, because Roman citizenship was becoming a legal fiction as opposed to an actual ethno-cultural reality. Um, well, and in fact, uh, in 69 AD, after Nero, uh, what happens is that Nero commits suicide, and then the legions of different parts of the empire all declare that their own commander is going to be the emperor. So as a result, in the year 69, you actually have four competing claimants to the throne, four people claiming to be emperor. Um, and some of these guys were, were quite de-Romanized indeed. Uh, so, for example, in uh, 69 AD, while these, um, the armies of these four people claiming to be emperor are fighting one another, um, some of them, for example, are seen in Rome. And um, when the sun is rising in the morning, they actually turn and uh, you know, sort of worship the sun, which is quite an unusual, uh, it's not a Roman practice at all. Uh, these, uh, these legions had gone native because they'd been out in the field, out in the east for uh, 20 years or 30 years or, or even more. Uh, so uh, you have a, a demographic decline. You have a turn towards um, non-Romans to fill out the ranks. Augustus didn't, didn't really like this. Augustus wanted to get things back as much as possible to Romanism, to Rome. And so he tried to uh, pass state legislation, actual government, to try to use the power of government to um, facilitate um, greater fertility among the Roman people. Let's put it that way. Uh, he tried to regulate uh, sex and marriage, basically. He tried to uh, restore the, uh, the, the Roman senatorial class uh, through legislation. Uh, as you might imagine, this didn't work at all. In fact, it was a laughingstock. Uh, Augustus' own daughter, Julia, uh, was a slut. I mean, if Augustus' own family wasn't able to live up to these standards, um, you know, it was a joke that anyone else would be expected to. Uh, and Augustus only had one daughter. Part of, uh, of Augustus' um, moral legislation was that he uh, imposed penalties for people who had no children and incentives, financial incentives, for people to have uh, as many children as possible. But Augustus himself only had one daughter, so uh, there's certainly not a case of leading by example there. Um, marriage, I mean, interestingly, I mean, right now you have a lot of debates here in America over things like gay marriage and, and divorce and things like this. Um, marriage in Roman times, during the Republic at least, had been almost completely a family matter. It was not something that the state regulated, controlled, or created. Um, Augustus, through his moral legislation, basically took over um, the administration of things like divorce and, uh, and marriage. Uh, this, again, is an extraordinarily revolutionary thing to do. This is something that was very, very much un-Roman. But as we've seen, uh, you know, this, the whole process of imperial expansion had de-Romanized things and had created such a crisis that it made, um, made the culture much more flexible, much more uh, amenable to these sorts of, uh, of changes, these sorts of revolutionary uh, alterations. Um, Robert Nisbet, who is an uh, American sociologist, he died around 1994 or so, uh, but a very good guy. He was a, uh, quite a, not exactly a libertarian, but he was, he was very much a scholar that we should have a look at, um, has written about how, in fact, during the Julio-Claudian period, the first century AD, um, imperium, which is the legal authority that a commander exercises over his troops, uh, displaced what had been patria potestas, the, uh, the power of the father, over his family. Um, in short, what you saw happening was that increasingly what defined um, a person's day-to-day -day life was his relationship to his military unit because you had had such a, a growth and expansion of military power. 
And less and less was it the case, as had been in earlier Roman days, that it was the family that was the central institution of Rome that had been the, the defining element. Uh, so, for example, people were spending less and less time under the authority of their father. Uh, in Rome, they were actually legally under the authority of their father. They could even be executed. Uh, even a fully grown son was still under the authority of his father. Well, uh, the exception to that, of course, was when he was out serving in the legions, where you could even potentially have a son outranking a father. Um, and so as you see the growth of imperium, the growth of military command, you see a, uh, a breakdown in patria potestas. Um, and this was tr true with respect to the emperor as well. The emperor was called the emperor precisely because he ex exercised imperium. And um, this had a, the effect of, of, of further um, weakening the traditional patria potestas. Um, instead, your relationship as a person towards the emperor, whether you were in his employ, whether you were getting money from him, whatever, uh, became more and more important than your relationship with your family had been. Uh, and it became less a matter of uh, you being from a noble family and trying to rise up in the ranks, as it had been during the Republican era, and instead was a matter of how you could please the emperor and the emperor's opinion mattered to you much more uh, if you were in his employ than your father's opinion. So uh, this contributed to the, uh, the social breakdown and the demographic decline of Rome as well. Um, what you had was uh, both political centralization and um, sort of cultural atomization, um, precisely because the relationship to the military or to the emperor took precedence over rela relationship to the family. And this, of course, also, um, as you might expect or may not, um, led to increasing uh, amounts of bachelorhood on the one hand and also promiscuity. Um, simply because uh, whereas the family had been concerned with keeping legitimacy, uh, you have to have legitimate offspring uh, with a legitimate wife in order to uh, pass down the property and also maintain the honor of your family, uh, during the, the empire this became less of an issue. Instead it was about getting your pension from the, the commander, um, from the legion and also from the emperor. Uh, so there was much less of an incentive to um, moral uh, sexual, I guess, fidelity. And um, that may tie into the, uh, the demographic uh, problems. Uh, so we, we've seen there, there were economic uh, changes in this period, there were demographic changes. Um, you may think, well, what about politics? Um, one of Augustus's great claims to fame was that he had brought peace back to Rome. Rome had previously uh, suffered under about a century of um, civil war. Um, if nothing else, didn't the military at least uh, stabilize um, Rome politically? Well, the answer to this is no. Uh, what in fact happened was that as soon as Augustus died in 14 AD, um, two legions, well actually a couple of legions, in Pannonia, which is more or less modern Hungary, and in Germany, revolted. They revolted, um, at, well, for very good reasons actually. Uh, they, were, they had been in the field for over 20 years in some cases. Uh, these had become quite old men. They were suffering from brutalities uh, at the hands of their commanders, um, as you might expect. I mean, this is the military. Uh, if your commander tells you to do something, you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you can be punished. Well, in, in the Roman case, it was a, uh, these punishments could be quite severe, whipping and scourging, um, whatever the commander felt like. Uh, this imperium really was, uh, did go that far. Uh, the imperium was such that a commander could do just about anything to his troops. Um, so conditions were just absolutely abominable within the military itself. And uh, as a result, um, you know, these, the soldiers just wanted out of this, this situation. Uh, and they wanted out of the field. I mean, you see right now, a lot of American soldiers want to be uh, brought home from Iraq. They've been there for about uh, you know, six months, in some cases maybe almost a year. With um, these Romans, some of them had been uh, in Hungary or in Germany for as much as 20 years or even 30 years. And even if they had very little chance of assimilating back into Roman culture at home, they at least wanted out of the military. They at least wanted to be decommissioned and to get their pension. And uh, you know, you saw the kinds of things going on here that you, uh, you often see in, in other states as well. Uh, the military does not want to, uh, or, sorry, the state uh, is quite uh, eager to cheat veterans out of their pensions. Uh, it's easy enough to do, so you know, that's something that the state sees as a way of saving money. And of course, as you can imagine, um, having Having 20 years of service and then another five years in the reserve meant that there, were a very, there was a very good chance that just because of old age, remember, you've got a life expectancy here of about uh, in the 40s or in the 50s, that if you kept someone in the military that long, uh, they would die before they could claim their pension. So this was another way of the state uh, saving money. And as it, it appears that about half of the legions would die before they reached the age at which they could claim their pension, and the other half actually were able to uh, reach that age, 
although whether or not they actually got their pension was another question. Um, so as a result of the terrible conditions and being cheated out of their pensions, uh, the Roman legions revolted in Germany and Pannonia, um, destabilizing Rome. Uh, they had to send other legions. They had to send uh, representatives of the emperor to negotiate with them, offer them uh, higher salaries and uh, more luxurious um, pension packages. And uh, you know, it succeeded. Tiberius was the one who did this. And he, he was able to quell the revolts in Pannonia and Germany. But nonetheless, it was a sign of you know, political problems down the road. Uh, there had also been the Praetorian Guard, which was um, established by Augustus. The Praetorian Guard was sort of the home guard for Italy and Rome. It was also the personal bodyguard for the emperor. Um, well, the Praetorian Guard had control over who got to see the emperor and who didn't. And as a result, um, it could sort of filter uh, his, uh, his appointments. And so the Praetorian Guard actually became very powerful, as perhaps you know. Um, and ultimately, the Praetorian Guard was in a position, if it wanted to, to kill the emperor and uh, appoint a successor. Um, Praetorians were involved in the assassination of Caligula, for example, and even earlier during uh, the period of, with Augustus, I'm uh, sorry, with uh, Tiberius, um, the Praetorian prefect Sejanus was almost as powerful as a co-emperor, basically, um, simply because of the, uh, the position that the Praetorian Guard enjoyed. Um, and then, of course, we see at the very end of the Julio-Claudian period in 69 AD, um, that uh, a civil war erupts again. You have four people claiming to be emperor. Um, different legions are supporting different claimants. And uh, the idea that, that uh, Augustus had established peace, well, it was a very temporary peace. It lasted from Augustus's reign down to the end of Nero. And even that had been interrupted by these periodic revolts in places like Pannonia in Germany. Um, basically, the military uh, was not a stabilizing force in Rome. It was a destabilizing force. It was something that uh, could... Uh, erupt into civil war unless very high salaries and pensions were paid and uh, very careful uh, measures were taken by the emperor. Um, that's, uh, those, those are the main elements I should cover here. And uh, in conclusion, uh, what you have going on, a number of the characteristics that had um, been essential to Rome during the Republican period, uh, that Romans generally did not pay taxes, that Romans, uh, what they did do is they served in the military, um, that Rome was, you know, had, had very high moral standards, that marital fidelity, while not, you know, obviously perfectly observed, uh, nonetheless counted, and uh, legitimacy in children was a very important thing. All of these things all the, sort of um, had gelled together during the Republican period, but these were slowly dissolved by the military uh, towards the end of the Republic, and then during the, uh, the early principate or the early empire, uh, it becomes uh, even worse. That basically the military was, because of its demands of money and men, uh, breaking down uh, all of these elements. It was breaking down the, the, uh, the social structure in Rome. It was breaking down um, the traditional Roman reservations against taxation. And it was, um, you know, uh, it, was, it was also not something that was terribly beneficial for a lot of the people serving in the legions themselves. And because the legions were increasingly having to draw upon uh, foreigners in order to fill out their ranks, uh, you even had a, a process of de-Romanization, that the legions became less and less tied to Rome culturally and, uh, and ethnically. Uh, so I would certainly say that uh, it looks to me as if what you see uh, in Rome is not a case of military virtue, of boot camp creating you know, um, better citizens, and of everyone coming together to support uh, a national identity. Um, so much as what you see is actually the destruction of what had once made Rome character characteristically Roman. Now, I guess you could say that you do see the creation of a new sort of identity out of all of this, uh, this decadence. You do see the rise of an imperial identity, uh, defined, of course, by the military, defined by the emperor as the supreme commander-in-chief, and by the legions, which uh, take on more and more importance as the, uh, the livelihood and as the sort of cultural milieu in which uh, large numbers of people live. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, that would be something that perhaps uh, militarists would like, that you can create a, a, an identity of sorts out of this. But traditionalists, I mean, people who actually value, you know, Romans who would have valued Rome uh, for what it had been, for all of the things that had made it characteristically Roman, avoidance of taxation, things like that, um, and the moral codes, um, Rome was no longer Roman at all. And that's why you see in historians like Tacitus, for example, um, in all of these Roman historians, uh, a very elegiac, a very gloomy sense that you know, Rome had fallen already. Even though, I mean, the Julio-Claudian period runs through 68 AD, 
Uh, Rome itself doesn't fall to the barbarians until 474 AD. So, I mean, the Roman Empire survived a very long time, but um, what had been great about Rome, what had been Roman about Rome, as far as you know, historians like Tacitus are concerned, had already died uh, by 31 or, well, in the period between 31 and 68 AD.